Kia ora koutou, everybody. We're here for a number of updates relating to our COVID-19 response today. It might take a little bit longer than usual because we've got a bit to cover. Uh, we will cover off the latest from the Northland January case uh, and also the, uh, some further detail on the two additional cases that were announced last night. Uh, Dr Bloomfield will address those shortly and provide the regular daily uh, numbers. But I want to start by reinforcing some of the specific actions that we have taken uh, with regard to the Pullman Hotel facility, which has now been closed to any new arrivals uh, whilst we continue the investigation process. Uh, that means that while the investigation is underway to identify how the infection may have spread within the hotel, no further returnees will be entering into uh, that facility. Once those who are currently there complete their stay and are given the all clear to leave, uh, the Pullman Hotel uh, will be empty for a period of time. Uh, that time will give us, it's a temporary measure, it'll give us the opportunity to give the facility a good uh, deep clean, and also during the period between now and then, uh, the thorough investigation will continue to identify whether there are any additional uh, measures that might need to be put in place uh, around that facility to see whether there are any uh, further risks uh, that might need to be mitigated. Um, such as um, uh, whether we need to make changes to the way exercise is managed within that hotel uh, and so on. As a general comment though, I do want to note that the Pullman Hotel uh, has performed remarkably well as one of our managed isolation facilities. It's one of the larger managed isolation facilities that we have um, and it has been uh, delivering very good results for us. The air conditioning system, as I've already indicated, uh, has been updated in terms of the way it's being used to better control airflows, particularly in those common spaces, uh, again, to help reduce the risk. Uh, any decision to bring the facility back online again will be uh, made once we're confident that any issues uh, that might exist with that hotel have been addressed and have been resolved. Uh, we have been continuing the investigation into these three cases. Uh, so we've got one case uh, who never made it out into the community. They ended up going straight to the jet park from the Pullman Hotel. Uh, but we know that that is the source case uh, for the uh, three other community cases uh, that we have been dealing with. I want to say of those three other cases, two of them are from the same family. 
Uh, I think when people hear that there are two new community cases, uh, there is an assumption that they are separate. They are from the same family. So we're dealing with our Northland case uh, and one other group of cases, if you like, which are the same family, two people. Um, we have, uh, through our investigation process, established that uh, our, our source case uh, and both of these uh, other cases that we're dealing with have been out of their rooms at the same time, although for different reasons. Uh, and so that uh, investigation continues as to uh, where they may have come into contact with each other, whether it might, might be a lift exercise area, common space, uh, or so on. But it, it does appear that there, there could be some circumstantial um, conditions uh, in which the virus may have been able to pass between them. Uh, we'll continue to try and assemble a fuller picture on that. We've made the decision uh, that all returnees across all of our isolation facilities uh, should remain in their rooms after they've had their day 12 test while we continue to figure out what has happened in these particular cases. So this is an interim measure, an additional layer of protection to ensure that people are not infected towards the end of their stay after they have had their final test. Uh, it is an interim measure um, and that uh, will be operationalised, fully operationalised from Saturday um, as the facilities work through the process of making sure that that can happen. Um, I'm also due to receive advice at the end of next week on any potential further improvements to the way we allocate rooms across our isolation facilities, uh, including whether we need to make changes to the way we stagger arrival and departure of guests. We already have been trying to keep cohorts together wherever possible, uh, we regard a cohort as being those who've come in on the same flight rather than those who have come from the same, uh, same countries uh, because we know that there has been in-flight transmission. So we're continuing to look at whether there are further refinements that can be made there. That includes some, some detailed modelling, uh, which is why that will take a little bit longer. I'm expecting to get that advice by the end of next week. Ultimately, our goal here is to minimise the risk of any indirect transmission uh, from people who are in the facilities. Uh, there are also spot checks underway in other managed isolation facilities around the country. Uh, and always, as always, uh, we want to have the best possible visibility around what's working well uh, and identify any issues that might need further attention. So that's been an ongoing part of our process uh, for some time now, and we're continuing to do that. Uh, the other uh, observation that I wanted to just reiterate was that uh, since uh, the events in question here, we've already made other changes. The introduction of day zero uh, slash day one testing uh, with people being required to isolate in their rooms up until, um, the, up until they've received their negative test result uh, has been introduced after the, uh, potentially after the events in question here, certainly after these, these people had arrived, so they weren't subject to that say, day zero, day one testing. So that, that change has already been made and that will make a difference uh, in the future. Uh, finally, just a quick update on the testing numbers at the Pullman Hotel. 219 staff worked at the Pullman Hotel between the 9th and the 13th of February. All have been contacted so far. 201 of those have been tested. Uh, 199 of those are back. Um, they were all negative. Uh, we're awaiting two test results, uh, and the re remaining staff members are being followed up to make sure that they get their tests. Uh, the contact tracing team advises that of the 353 guests that left the Pullman Hotel between the 9th and the 13th of January, um, that they have been uh, getting in touch with them since Sunday afternoon. Uh, all of them have been asked to have a test and to self-isolate. As of midday today, 301 of those former guests have been tested and their results have been received. Uh, all are negative, apart from uh, the two that we uh, indicated last night. We're awaiting results from uh, the remaining 52 people. Uh, I don't have an indication of how many of those have been tested, and we're just awaiting the results and how many of those have yet to be tested, but there's 52 in that category that we are actively following up uh, with to make sure that they are tested and that we get those results as soon as we can. So I'll now hand over to Dr Bloomfield for uh, a bit more detail on the cases, and then we will uh, open up for questions. Thank you, Minister, and kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, so first, a brief update on our Northland case. As I mentioned yesterday, this person is now officially considered to be recovered. 
uh, and the close contacts of that person remain in isolation until the full 14-day period since they were last exposed to the, to the case, um, and we have continued to receive negative test results from those who have been further tested. Now to the two cases that we reported last evening. These two people are linked to the border uh, who have tested positive and are in the community. Uh, the two people, a father and young daughter, have been moved to the Auckland Quarantine Facility and a third family member, the mother, has continued to test negative and will isolate uh, at home as a close contact for the full 14-day period as well. Uh, I do want to encourage everyone to respect this family's privacy. Remember, it could be any one of us in this situation and we must all act with kindness and compassion as we respond and as they support our contact tracing and follow-up efforts. As the Minister mentioned, uh, early this morning uh, we received the genome sequencing results which do confirm that the two people uh, have the variant first identified in South Africa and our ESR colleagues uh, described the four genome sequences, that is the original case uh, who uh, was identified uh, who, who uh, arrived on the 9th of uh, January at the Pullman and was identified in, on the 13th. Our case in Northland and these two, they, they, their genome sequence is consistent with a single chain of transmission, so they are related. And further investigations, both genomic and uh, epidemiological, continue. Again, a shout out to colleagues both at ESR and also at Massey University Lab where the actual sequencing was done in Auckland uh, last night for working into the evening uh, and into the early hours of the morning to expedite those results. Uh, it's important to point out at this stage we have no evidence of any community transmission, but of course we are responding and acting accordingly to uh, ensure that that is the case and if we do find other cases to uh, act quickly to uh, get around those. Now on the contact tracing front, interviews have been carried out with the family to determine their movements on departing managed isolation. And late last evening, we published the list on the Ministry of Health website of the locations of interest and uh, sent out a push notification via the NZ COVID Tracer app. And I want to uh, thank uh, the media who conveyed that information to the public uh, both last evening and uh, this morning. Now, that list will uh, develop and change as we get more information about the case's movements and we will continue to update and publicise any changes. Uh, we can confirm that the father had not been at work since leaving managed isolation and the child has not been at an early childcare centre. Now, some exposure events, uh, as you will see on the list, are for relatively long time periods. The reason is so we cast the net wide. It doesn't matter, it doesn't necessarily mean the people were there for a long time period, but uh, we've cast the net wide as a precaution. There are a number of days between the 18th and 23rd of January where at the moment no locations of interest are listed. That may be because there are none, because they didn't go out, or because we are still uh, finding out more information, and we will update as we get it. Uh, I want to thank those people who had scanned into those venues. 168 people received the notification through the uh, push out through the NZ COVID Tracer app last evening. And so far we've determined the two cases have 11 close contacts and they are now isolating. Uh, at least five uh, have had test results returned and uh, those were all negative. Uh, just on the testing front, an update there, uh, it's important of course the right people get access to testing. I want to thank uh, the staff in Auckland who set up additional testing sites in um, uh, Albany and in uh, Orewa. Uh, overnight and uh, operating from this morning. Initially, some queues. They are now the queues are now down to I understand between 30 and 45 minute wait. Uh, so great work there, and it's important the right people go to be tested. That is anyone with symptoms, of course, and people who are at those locations of interest on the same dates and at the same times as our cases were. Uh, the two pop-up stations uh, are, in, are, are in addition to the six uh, existing Auckland-wide community testing centres alongside primary care and urgent care centre testing. The details are available on the Auckland Regional Public Health website. In the, in the first few hours, around 600 swabs were taken alone just at the two pop-up stations in Albany and Orewa. And there are some further welfare measures uh, in, uh, in place at, at uh, those sites too, including food, water and sunscreen. Uh, public health nurses are going down the queues to provide welfare checks and ensure that the right people are there waiting for testing and there is traffic management in place. So thank you to everyone who is turning up 
to be tested to help our efforts here. Uh, over the last 24 hours, uh, our latest count shows 8,306 tests processed, and over the last seven days, that's 36,230 tests. And since Sunday, up till last evening, there were 17,179 tests in the Auckland and Northern regions. Thank you, everybody who's been tested. That is uh, really helpful in terms of us uh, ensuring that we are detecting early or ruling out any community transmission. I uh, also want to finish, of course, with uh, the usual plug for the use of the NZ COVID Tracer app. Great to see that big surge in scans to over a million yesterday. I'd like to see that going up even f further. Um, and as we've found again in, the, in, in these two cases, uh, we never know when we may need to have that information from both our QR code scanning and having the Bluetooth uh, function turned on in the app. Thanks, Minister. Jessica. For managed isolation, when you've got some people who perhaps arrive uh, first off and then you've got people leaving, what are those regulations and were they being followed at the pool room? Because it does seem surprising that people were staying across the corridor from each other with such different arrival times. Yeah, so that's one of the things that we'll look at is the overall room allocation. We do try and keep, as I indicated, cohorts together. So a plane comes in, we try and keep them at the same facility if we can. One of the things that we'll, we'll look more actively at is whether we can actually manage it so that they're on the same floors, for example, so you don't have different cohorts spread across floors. Those are the sorts of things that we've got to look at. Obviously, the logistics of that um, create a greater challenge. Um, it is quite difficult to manage all of the ins and outs of people because they don't always, always, you know, people don't all leave at the same time. In an ideal world, we would have the same number of people arriving every day and the same number of people leaving every day. That's not the way the managed isolation facilities work, um, and we try and optimise the use of those facilities. Um, if we make changes to the way we do room allocations, it's possible that we won't be able to fit quite as many people in. So those are the that's the modelling that's happening at the moment. We're waiting for further advice on that, but isn't it a no-brainer that? you need to keep people separate so they can't cross-contaminate and why not just make that ruling now? Well, well, let's be clear about this. When Once people arrive in a managed isolation facility, regardless of whether they were on the same cohort or on the same flight, uh, we try and keep them apart from one another once they're through the door. And the idea of isolation is it's just that. It's isolation. So people isolate either by themselves or if they're in a room with someone else, uh, they isolate with that person. And we try and ensure that they don't come into contact with anybody else. But obviously we look at you know how we can do room allocations better to manage the risk better. But as I've said, uh, with every one of those decisions, there are flow-on consequences for that, and we do have to work our way through that. The two remaining guests that you're waiting on tests from at the polling could represent more cases in the community. Why is that taking so long? Uh, ultimately, I understand that the, the contact tracers have been very effective in getting in touch with them. Um, ultimately, the the delay, any delay there will be. Uh, in them getting their tests. And there can be a variety of different reasons for that, but obviously we want them to get their tests as soon as they can. Can you be more proactive in that, as in sending testers to them? If oh, look, certainly we're, we're following up regularly with people um, as, as necessary. If we do need to do other things like mobile testing, we'll leave that as an option. Uh, but certainly, you know, we... We're very successful in getting the bulk of them tested very quickly. Uh, there is this tail of people, and we obviously want to test them as quickly as we can. Well, I'll, let you, I'll let you finish that line that of question. point in the CCTV footage where it seems all three groups... So that's not from CCTV, one. that's from accessing the data around when they when they left their rooms and when they went back into their so, rooms. So when in their in their stay was that? Was that after the, after the test? There were several different occasions through their stay where that... Um, took place. There was a period of time, uh, several days, uh, where all three were in the in the in the um, hotel at the same time, um, and so there are several occasions where they where they where there have been overlaps. Back on the fifty-two, back on the fifty-two guests, are you confident that they are isolating and they're not a threat? Uh, certainly, those that we have uh, got in contact with, and I'm, I understand it, that's pretty much all of them that we've been in contact with now have been asked to isolate, um, and you know. I'm, I'm sure they will be. It appears, much that, it appears is, to is it all of them or not all Look, of I'll, them? Look, I'll absolutely confirm for you. I don't know whether, Dr Bloomfield, whether you've got any uh, indication of whether there are any that are still to be contacted, but my understanding is that they have all been contacted. Everybody but, has been contacted, yeah. and yes, there are still some results outstanding. Uh, it may be that the majority of those people have been tested, and we're just waiting to see the negative results come through. 
uh, our teams are constantly uh, following up with them. The other thing I would say is that when initial contact with May was made, there were 14 people who reported symptoms. All those people have tested and returned a negative result. I'll come to Jane. It, it, it appeared that um, after the direction was given for departings from the Pullman, that the Auckland cases went to two supermarkets after they'd been asked to self-isolate. Is that correct? And have you brought that up with them? And what are you doing to make sure that all other departees are actually self-isolated? Uh, so I don't know the exact details, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming you're looking at looked at the places of interest. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, the places of interest, they visited them after yeah. um, the direction was given on the Sunday. Yeah, so the direction was given, and then everyone was phoned, of course, and asked to um, do, do that. And it may well be they hadn't heard the public announcements, and that's why everyone is phoned as well, and direct contact is made. And my clear understanding is that once that contact had been made, they did exactly what was asked, they isolated, and then were tested. Is that being reinforced? Because obviously this is a very high-risk group, and they're being tested, and is that part of the messaging about the need to self-isolate until community transmission is being ruled out? Oh, absolutely. Look, the contact tracers are, are in touch with every individual. Um, and they run through all of the detail that those people need to know in terms of what we're asking them to do, what our expectations of them are. The, the, the Prime Minister um, this morning said that they were looking at extra requirements for people coming out of managed isolation facilities. I was wondering if you might be able to tell us what these extra requirements are in light of the last couple of days. So we have looked at this before. Um, you might um, be familiar with the fact that we did look at whether we should have a pre, uh, post-departure test uh, last year, late last year, and as a result of that, whilst we stopped short of a test, we introduced follow-up phone calls to everybody. So once they've left, uh, you know, after several days, they get a follow-up phone call, which includes a symptom check. We will look at that again, and we are going to look at that again to see whether that's still the right measure or whether there should be other measures that we might put in place. People might hear that answer and think just a follow-up phone call isn't really enough, given that Auckland is at stake when it comes to another community outbreak. Is there more that the government could be doing? Look, again, that's one of the things that we will look at. At the time that we looked at it last, which, again, was only, you know, not late in the year last year, uh, that was the appropriate balance. That was, you know, based on the risk that we foresaw at that point, that was the, the appropriate measure. Now, risk profiles change, and we continue to review based on the latest information. What are they being told to do at the moment? Sorry, what's that? What are people told, being told at the moment when they leave managed isolation? The Prime Minister said that... Um, the government was make, giving them very clear instructions as to what they were supposed to be doing. Just curious about what those instructions are. They are. They, they get quite detailed instructions when they leave. And again, that was something that flowed from the last review we did late last year. We looked again at that material. Um, I'll ask Dr Bloomfield to comment on the specifics of that, but they certainly do get uh, a lot more information now than they would have been in the early, earlier phases of our response. Yes, the key thing they get now is very clear information about um, what symptoms to look for and what to do if they do become symptomatic. Uh, and also um, many of them um, who are maybe returning to New Zealand after a long period have got information about um, various other things around um, uh, perhaps benefits and housing information. I should say that, there's, that the information is very clear and what we have seen in the case, for example, of our Northland case, is this person, despite having had the negative tests in managed isolation, did the right thing, isolated and was tested. But on the, 14, on, the, on the 14 people who had symptoms when they were followed up with contact tracers, were they then tested after the contact tracers contacted them and they said they had symptoms or proactively got the tests? themselves and let the contact tracers know that they had symptoms and then got a test? I, I, I couldn't say exactly, but um, remember that all those people would have received that day a call on day three to five post-departure, and in fact that's why we have been able to contact all of them, because we now have good um, ways, uh, contact information for people departing. And so when they, one of the qu questions they are asked when they were followed up, the 354s. Have you got any symptoms at the moment? A small proportion, remember this is 14 out of 354, said, yes, I have got one or more of those symptoms. And then, of course, they were tested alongside everybody else and we prioritised getting those results back. Mr. Jessica. Mr. Bloomfield, on those 52 uh, remaining tests, are they being fast-tracked and when will we get the results back? And just in the context of that, what's the advice for people who are looking to go away for the long weekend? Will we get those results back? by 1 o'clock tomorrow so you can give that advice to people. Well, I haven't got anything to add other than what the Minister said, I think, at some length, you know, where we, we are continuing to follow those people up and we will actively do that. And uh, we, everyone who is followed up has got a special code on their sample so they know to 
expedite getting the test done and then reporting the results. Uh, we will do an update. If we have further information, we'll do another update on those results. At the should later. Still, sorry, just for that question, should people still go away for the long weekend? Is that the advice, or should they be staying at home? Uh, generally. Uh, yes, yeah. generally. Well, at the moment, uh, we are, you know, today and tomorrow is when we are looking to see if there's any wider community spread, we will have a very good picture by this time tomorrow, especially with all the testing that is being done. So, Gina, no other advice at this stage. Are you relatively confident that it was person-to-person -person contact that resulted in the new cases? And if so, do you think it was in the exercise area? I'll ask, the, I'll ask the Director General to comment on that. In terms of the feedback that I've had from MIQ um, and their investigations is that they, they haven't been able to reach a conclusion on that. So it could be person to person, it could be, uh, there could be some surfaces involved, uh, you know, all of those possibilities, none of them are being discounted at this point. They'll continue to investigate all of those options very thoroughly. But I'll, I'll ask the Director General to comment. Yes, so we're still looking at all those options and one of the things we talked about this morning was, and that has been looked at already, is whether they used a lift at the same time or... Uh, closely after each other. What seems clear is that um, uh, all three of the cases that we've identified over the last few days have become infected by the original um, source case there, and so that may have been through uh, you know, a fomite transmission or through aerosol uh, transmission. And, and the important thing at looking at all of these um, options and not shutting our minds to anything is that we take all the potential precautions, additional precautions, to rule out that thing, that happening again. Okay, we'll come over here. Just follow up on Jane, uh, on your answer to Jane. So th th these people in, in Auckland, uh, two days after, so on Sunday they, they were told they should self they should self isolate at home. And according to what you put out, on Tuesday afternoon they were still out of the supermarket. You said maybe they hadn't seen the news or they hadn't been contacted. But is that acceptable that 48 hours later they still wouldn't have heard or seen any newscasts? Especially if they had just exited MIQ, shouldn't there be an obligation for them to be paying attention? Look, I, I would ask people to pay attention. I'd ask everyone in the country actually to pay attention to what we're doing around our COVID-19 response and to follow the public health guidance that gets issued in response to any event. I can't comment on the specifics of that. Obviously, the individual contact traces that have been talking to that family may have an explanation for exactly what happened there. Um, I don't have that information with me. With the Pullman, which is a large facility, not taking returnees at the moment, what pressure is that putting on the MIQ system and how are you managing that? So we have a contingency built in, and the contingency is to allow for exactly these types of events. So if we had to evacuate a facility, say there was a fire, um, if we had an emergency landing where we suddenly had a whole lot of people that we needed to accommodate, we do have a contingency to allow for that. So what that will mean is that whilst the numbers at the Pullman will steadily decline, um, the people who might otherwise have gone there will be absorbed in other parts of the system using that contingency. That's exactly what it's there for. The system is designed to allow for any of these sorts of events should we need to. And tell us that they visited the Taiping supermarket in Northcote about a week ago and there was no QR code on display so they complained to the authorities. Are you aware of that and whether they have a QR code up now? Not aware of that particular store but I can just make a general observation about QR codes across the country. Uh, which is that we do get increasing numbers of reports of people saying, look, while a QR code is on display, it's not prominent. You actually have to go searching for it, and most people won't. If they walk past and see it, they'll scan it, but if they have to go searching for it, they won't. So my message to all businesses um, is please continue to pay your part here. Make sure you have it prominently displayed, preferably put up multiple copies of it uh, around the place so that if there's a queue for people to scan, you just walk to the next code and you can scan there. The other reminder I'd say to people is, um, and look, hand on heart, I've made the odd mistake myself, if you forget to scan on the way in, scan on the way out. Make sure that you're keeping a record of where you've been um, so that, you know, in the event that we need to, to contact Trace for you, we can. We've heard that apparently uh, there uh, isn't CCTV on every floor at the pool. And have you run into any difficulties gathering that CCTV because of that? Um, my understanding is that the... The CCTV upgrades, you know, that we've been rolling out, uh, the Pullman has not yet been completed, so it is not as good as it is at some of our other facilities. Um, and so, but I, I think there's generally good visibility of the common areas where people are likely to have come into contact, but I can't say for certain exactly that every common area is covered. Yes. Is, is that, is that 
provided a difficulty in, in tracing this, this particular case? Oh, I mean, obviously, the, the CCTV improvements that we're making across the board make, make life easier for us. They're designed for MIQ needs, uh, and so um, it is unfortunate that the Pullman is one of the last to get that upgrade. And is it true that the COVID tests at the Pullman are on the 12th floor, and as a result, people are sort of moving between elevators or stairs to get there? Um, I'll ask the Director General to comment on that. I don't have the exact yeah. details, but certainly um, different ho the different hotels have uh, the testing rooms in different places. Would you be concerned with that, Dr. Blanchard? Well, this is one of the things we're looking at in particular, and again, we had this discussion with our MB colleagues this morning, is uh, being really clear about the reasons why people are leaving their rooms and trying to minimise that to the greatest extent possible and to ensure that any movement outside of the rooms is for a short period of time and that people are separated quite clearly um, and in particular if possible that those when people leave their rooms that is supervised. Could you give us a little bit more information as to what exactly constitutes a deep clean? I'll get the Director General to comment on that. I just, I mean, uh, I know Dr Woods, Megan Woods, went through some of this with um, uh, with all of you some months ago about what happens when someone, a positive case, leaves a room, for example, where it's very thoroughly cleaned and then there's some misting that goes on as an extra layer of protection as well. But I'll ask the Director General to comment. I'm sorry I don't have the detail on that, yeah. Minister, but I'd say it's a very, very thorough clean. Yeah. How long would you yeah. expect that to take for the entire hotel? Uh, look, I imagine that the you know rooms will be progressively cleaned um, as they empty out. It may be that we reach the you know that we get a conclusion before the hotel is fully empty. But what we're saying is we're, we're preparing for if we need to have this hotel empty for a period while we work through any you know improvements that might need to be made. We can do that, and we will well, plan for that. On movement, the restriction on movement in, out of hotel rooms after the twelve eight test. Why is that only a temporary measure? It would seem sensible to. Well, it, it, I should say it's an interim measure. It doesn't necessarily mean temporary. Sometimes interim measures become permanent. But at the moment, it is an interim measure. We haven't made a decision to, to make that a permanent feature. But for now, it will be put in place. Why wouldn't you roll it out? Uh, well, look, again, we, we've got to work, work through the issues more thoroughly. Um, one of the things that I'm aware of as a minister is when you make decisions in haste, sometimes you need to look back on those and review whether that was the right decision. This is a decision that we have made quickly. Um, so before I was, you know, to say it's going to be a permanent feature, I do want to have the opportunity to consider that a bit more. Um, but it, it may well be something or a variant thereof um, that we put in place in the longer term. Jane? How quickly could New Zealand manufacture vaccines if patients are lifted and whereabouts could... You know, how many potential manufacturers would there be here? Uh, my understanding is that our vaccine capability, manufacturer capability in New Zealand, is actually quite limited. Um, that's from discussions that we... I haven't discussed that recently, but that is from discussions that we were having sort of towards the middle of last year uh, that I was involved with. Um, I don't think we have a huge number of plants, for example, that could be repurposed for, for vaccine manufacture, but I, I might ask the Director-General whether he has any more information on that than I do. Uh, only to say that uh, one of the first steps we took as we were looking at the... Uh, or when the outbreak first started was to invest in... Uh, scaling up uh, the possibility of vaccine manufacture here in New Zealand. But as the Minister said, it would take quite a while to, to be able to stand that up if we needed to. One of the advantages we do have is we're close to Australia that has CSL, that does have manufacturing capability, and it is has already got a licence to manufacture the AstraZeneca one. Manufacturing wouldn't necessarily be um, something that you could look at in the short term to get the, get the doses higher. It would maybe potentially be a longer term option, but not going to help. Look, you never rule anything in or out, but what I'm saying is there's no instant switch we could flick and say, well, let's just start making it ourselves, and, and that, that could happen quickly. So, uh, National Party calling for a full audit and review that you've said that basically is happening. Do you not accept that there is a need for that, and given the light of these um, three cases? In, in terms of the, man, the way managed isolation facilities operate, yeah. So we review those regularly. We'll do another review. We do have regular infection prevention and control audits happen in all of these facilities uh, and we release information about those so um, we'll look at uh, what more we might need to put out there uh, about that so yeah so I mean that's exactly why we're, we're um, not accepting new guests at the Pullman so that that can be you know looked at very very closely. Because you're not accepting new guests I mean you've said, said about the buffer but my read of the numbers is that you don't really have enough of a buffer to cover the 340 beds at the Pullman so there will be a loss of some capacity. No, we will be able to accommodate all those who have vouchers and all those that we're needing to accommodate. Is, is the full number of beds shrinking slightly? Um, well, 
ultimately, if we leave a room empty, it's still there if we absolutely needed to use it. Like if there was an emergency and we absolutely needed to use it, then of course we could. But at the moment, we'll make the choice to use to to, to add that as part of the contingency. Slight, a slight degree less capacity in the No, no, within the contingency we have enough to be able to accommodate. Because some of the staff weren't on site when the testing started. Oh, okay. We'll do one at a time. Let's go. Our COVID okay. response has been labelled by an Australian think tank as the best in the world. What are your thoughts on that, especially in light of what's going on at the moment? Um, look, very humbling um, to see those kind of things. I'm reluctant to make any kind of judgment on New Zealand's response until this is all over um, because, uh, you know, I've... I've, I've very proud of what New Zealand as a country has achieved up until this point, and I think we can all be proud of that. But as recent events have shown, there's never any room for, for complacency or for boasting. We've got to remain vigilant. We've got to respond quickly where we need to. So um, it's too early to be drawing those, you know, any kind of conclusion, conclusive um, result on, on how, our, how we've done. Luke. Um, can we just go back to the, uh, the investigations into the index case and... How, can you just go into more detail on how that investigation is conducted? So you presumably have interviews with these people. How long have they been interviewed for? And then CCTV footage. Like how long does it take to review it all? Um, if I could make a few observations and then um, I'll ask the Director-General to comment more. So uh, the index case would, would actually be the case zero, if you like, which is the person who never made it out of um, managed isolation. They basically got their positive ta uh, test around day three. They were transferred to the jet park. Um, so a limited amount of contact tracing needed to happen there because we knew exactly where they had been for the, you know, the period where there, there may have been some risk. But they would have been spoken to to identify whether there was anything uh, additional that we needed to take into account. In terms of the Northland case, um, so uh, it's a pretty comprehensive interviewing process, and if you, uh, which includes looking at you know what information they've got, their QR code data, their Bluetooth data, and so on, if you look at the detail and the level of detail and the information that gets released, you can see it's a pretty thorough investigation of someone's life during the period of time in question. Yeah, well, I, I, what I'm, I guess what I'm asking about is investigate into how they how they came into contact with case zero, which presumably happened in managed isolation, so it is a smaller window of time. We don't seem to have much information about that, so I'm just curious about yeah. the process by which you get that information, and do you think it is taking a reasonable amount of time? Yeah, so um, obviously CCTV is a, is a part of it, swipe card data is a part of it, you know, interviews with staff if need be are, are all part of that. Those things all do take time. What are, what are, probably another pressure that I think we should acknowledge is that there's, there are two pressures that go on when you're dealing with a case like this. The first is to say, how do we stop the spread? And then the second is to say, how, how did it happen? And we're trying to do both of those things at the same time. Um, and so you're trying to get different bits of information in a fairly pressured environment. And we have to bear in mind that the more you put someone under pressure, if you're interviewing them, the less likely they are to be able to actually remember. Sometimes it takes several interviews for people to be able to fully share all of the information that they need because they feel under enormous amount of pressure um, when they're being interviewed, and, and we have to show a little bit of humanity in that process as well. But I'll ask the Director-General to comment too. Oh, thanks, Minister. And just to add, so um, as part of that interview with the cases, and also with the index case who was spoken with um, once the link was made, there is a sort of detailed interview to find out, to ask them about their movements when they were in the hotel and what, they, what sort of things they were going out for and why, and if they remember seeing certain people or being close to people. Staff interviews, as the Minister uh, mentioned, but also, and one of the good things about the Pullman is it's very good swipe card data. So once they've gone through each room and to find out exactly uh, where and when they both came out of the room and or hopped into lifts or went into other areas where they would swipe their card, and then what they can do is marry those up and see, OK, was the person in that room in, in the same place or indeed, in the first case, out of their room at the same time as, as uh, one of the others, and then the CTV... CCTV footage is looked through, but of course that takes time to go through and identify exactly the two people just to see if there was any uh, opportunity where they were in proximity to each other. 
So all of that uh, is done as quickly as possible. Okay. okay. The, national, okay. We'll come over here. the yep. national iwi pandemic response group are calling for the government to reduce the amount of people coming into the country to 1,500 and also to introduce lamp and antigen testing. Is this something you'd consider? So um, in terms of the testing, we're always looking at different testing methods, what's going to be most effective, what's going to give us a good, reliable result, and if there's ways that we can speed up that process, we always consider that. So we're looking at, um, as we've already said, we, we have saliva testing underway now um, on a, more of a trial basis um, to see what that can add. It's a supplement to our PCR testing, but it's not a replacement for it. In terms of the overall number of people that we've got coming in, again, I'll, I just want to reiterate the headline numbers here. We've had over 100,000 people go through our managed isolation facilities and we've dealt with a handful of cases. And even countries that are accepting smaller numbers of people, they have still ended up dealing with, uh, with incidents. So um, in Australia, for example, where people don't leave their rooms, they have still ended up dealing with incidents similar to this. There is absolutely no risk-free pathway here. Uh, what we are, what we are endeavouring to do is provide safe passage for New Zealanders back into the country so that we're keeping COVID-19 at the border. There are already significant delays for people who are trying to get back into the country. And just in regards to um, the latest cases, will you be giving Minister Davis or Te Arafiti any advice around the government's presence at Waitangi next week? Uh, as the Director General has indicated, uh, I imagine in the next 24 to 48 hours we'll have more information about whether we need to do anything around alert levels or any changes. At this point, um, I haven't seen information that would indicate that there is that risk. We're not seeing any evidence of community transmission at this point, which is encouraging. But again, you know, things can change quickly. If we see information that means we need to respond, then of course we will do that. I'll do one more sweep of the room and this time I'll start over this side. Yeah. Um, a large proportion of people have been contacting the Ministry of Health having issues with enabling the Bluetooth function on the Tracer app. So my question is, is it working as effectively as previously hoped? And also, are you still investigating the likes of a COVID card for those who may not be able to afford newer versions of smartphones or for the elderly who find this technology difficult? So the answer to the latter question is yes, we're always looking at that um, effectively People are turning their, their phones into a, if they turn on Bluetooth, their phone is effectively turned into a COVID card. Um, same technology, same outcome, same result. Um, but we're always looking at how we can make that better. Um, well, the, these apps are developed at, in, in speed. Some older models of phones, you know, the, the functionality, the, the ability to accommodate them gets added as we go along. So um, for those who don't, um, uh, who are having difficulty, please make sure you've got the latest version. That's the, that's the first piece of advice. Check that you've downloaded uh, and installed the latest version of the app because we are releasing new updates all of the time. Uh, Dr Bloomfield, uh, Albany uh, Westfield Farmers is one of the locations of interest. Can you just explain why the farmers is a location of interest but not the whole mall where they may have, uh, is there concern they may have gone through the mall to the farmers or back? Look, I don't know the detail there, but I do have a lot of uh, confidence in our um, team at Auckland Regional Public Health who would, the Medical Office of Health would have done a detailed interview and uh, if there was any risk for people walking through the mall, they would have um, uh, added that. But uh, obviously they just uh, accessed the farmer's store at least for a period of time. Yeah. Hey, Minister, just quickly on any alert level changes, will it be the Prime Minister still to announce any alert level changes? I would imagine so. Audrey. Um, why was the genome testing done by Massey and not Mount Albert ESR? And um, what was the advantage of getting it done um, more quickly? So, uh, look, I can't answer the first part of the question, but the, the testing was able to be done there. And we have uh, worked with ESR over the last few months to have uh, capacity to do the PCR testing both in Auckland and indeed in Christchurch as well, if needed. Um, and so that meant the sample could be... Um, got on the analyzer earlier, but then I dare say the matching with earlier genomes, because the sort of genome bank is with ESR in Wellington, so once they've run the test, either in Auckland or if it's ever done in Christchurch, it's still our ESR team here at Kenapuru that does the matching and does then the, what they call the phylogenetic tree to find out exactly where it fits and compares with other earlier samples. But we knew the genome that's sequencing a lot earlier than the Northland case, didn't we, with the North Shore case, or the o case. Uh, In fact, both of them, they uh, they ran the sample from as soon as they received it into the evening and, and reported it overnight. So in both cases, uh, we got it more or less uh, within 24 hours of having the confirmed test result. Are we looking into the possibility of, of post-isolation testing or post-isolation self-isolation? Yeah, that's, uh, as I indicated, our post-stay uh, measures are one of the things that we're, we're reviewing. When would you have an answer on that? Uh, within within a week or two. These two 
cases would never have been picked up if it wasn't for the first case, given they're asymptomatic. So did we really dodge a bullet here? Um, obviously, the, can, can I just take a step back to the introductory remarks that I made, which is our day zero, day one testing um, is actually designed to help alleviate these kind of risks. So it may well be that the person who tested positive on day three would have tested positive at that day zero, you know, as soon as they arrived, and they would have gone straight to the jet park, and they wouldn't have been uh, in, the, in the Pullman in the first place. So we have, you know, we're always looking for where there might be an ability to drive a little, you know, drive any more risk out of the system. There will always be risk. There, you know, it's a, it's a virus. There's no way to have an absolutely risk-free system. But we always look for where we can make the risk as small as possible. Do you regret not doing that earlier then, bringing in that day zero testing? Uh, look, I mean, at the time, uh, we, we're always looking at how we can continue to improve things. Uh, the day three and the day 12, when we introduced it, was the gold standard. Um, now we've... we've if you feel like we're moving to a platinum standard. Is Jim. it good enough that there were, uh, that staff is it good enough that staff were not on site at one of the North Shore testing stations when it was due to open this morning? I'll, I'll let the director general comment on that. I, I understand that's not that's not true, but yeah. yeah. Look, um, I just want to pay credit to the staff. They, my understanding is that they were there setting up and uh, getting testing underway. Of course, first thing there are people I do know who go in queue before the opening time, but um, uh, the wait times are at both those testing sites on the North Shore, the additional ones, are now down to around half an hour. I think that's great effort. Do you, do you expect the workers and cleaners at isolation hotels to be wearing, who go home to the community at night, to be wearing masks at all times? Uh, they will be wearing masks in accordance with the infection prevention control protocols that apply in all our managed isolation facilities, and those are reviewed regularly. I did say that we were going to wrap up there, um, but I'll let you have the lucky last question. All right, just, just on vaccine rollouts, 59 countries have already started vaccinating people around the world, 80 million shots administered in the US alone, more than a million people a day are getting vaccinated. Um, so when you say that we're at the front of the queue for getting vaccinations, we're really going to be behind most other countries, both for frontline workers and for the general population. Um, are we in the wrong queue? Uh, no, absolutely not. I think I've, I've, we've been through this before. We are not using emergency vaccination approval processes here in New Zealand. In terms of regular vaccination approvals processes, uh, when we expect to see vaccines arriving through our advanced purchase agreements, uh, we're expecting to be you know, at the front of the queue, broadly in line with what other countries who are in the same position as us are doing. All right, go on we're, then. We're, yeah, we're, we're, did we cover off the <coughs> positive cases in MIQ today? Because I can't recall that. No, we didn't. I was wondering if someone would ask me. It will be in our media release. But, um, last final question. Yes, so in addition to the two border-related cases, there are three new um, other cases to report in our managed isolation facilities. All have been transferred to a quarantine facility in Auckland, and four of our previously reported cases are now recovered, so we have 69 uh, active cases presently. All right, thank you. No, nice try, nice try. I think we'll draw a, draw a line on it. We'll have more to say on that uh, in due course.